At the beginning of the pandemic, like everyone else, I was hearing lots about viruses, but realized I didn't really know that much about what they are. So I did a load of research and have summarized what I learned in these nine images. Okay, let's get into it. Viruses are the most abundant form of life on Earth. But are they life? Not really. They can't reproduce on their own, so they have to invade other cells to take over their molecular machinery to reproduce using the steps shown here, which I'll go into more detail later. There's an unknown number of different kinds of virus, definitely in the millions, if not higher, but only about 6,000 have been studied in detail. They vary wildly, invading all kinds of cells, animals, plants, bacteria, and archaea, and none of them work in precisely the same way. Despite this bewildering range, it's possible to make some categorizations, although please be aware that there are exceptions to any category that I'm defining. That's the nature of any subject as complex as virology. With that in mind, viruses always contain a genome, the instructions for making more viruses, and a protective shell made of proteins called a capsid, which keeps the virus safe and helps the virus stick to and enter the cells they're invading. Some viruses are also coated in an envelope, a greasy cover taken from the membrane of the last cell they infected. Viruses are incredibly small. For example, an average human cell is a bit smaller than a tenth of a millimetre, or a hundred micrometres. And viruses are around a thousand times smaller than that, ranging from around 20 nanometers upwards. Here are a few virus particles drawn to scale. Hepatitis A, hepatitis C, coronavirus, influenza, HIV, and the humongous Ebola virus. For some viruses, their genome is really small, coding for just two proteins. But other viruses code for up to 2,500 proteins for the largest genomes. There are a few ways to classify viruses. The genome of a virus is either based on DNA or RNA, and is either single-stranded or double-stranded. Viruses come in a wide range of shapes. The capsid of viruses are made from many of the same shaped proteins that self-assemble into different shapes, like helical, which is a spiral, icosahedral, made of shapes like triangles or hexagons or pentagons, to make a shape like a 20-sided dice or a soccer ball. Prolate, which is the same kind of thing, but stretched out. Complex, which covers a wide range of viruses that don't fit into the other categories. And finally, enveloped viruses, which we mentioned earlier. There's a scientific way to classify viruses by following the official taxonomy. Another useful classification technique is the Baltimore classification, which looks at the genome of a virus and its pathway to encoding messenger RNA, or mRNA, which is a single-stranded molecule that the host cell uses to make the virus proteins. There are seven classes in the Baltimore classification which represent different forms of single and double-stranded DNA and RNA. For an example, let's look at the coronavirus that caused the 2020 pandemic. It's an envelope virus, meaning that it's very vulnerable to soap, which rips off the outer protective coat, destroying it, which is why we've been told to wash our hands so often. And in the Baltimore classification, it's a class 4 virus, which is a type of single-stranded RNA virus. Interestingly, this is different to seasonal flu, which is a class 5 virus, so the two are not related. Now let's look in a bit more detail about how viruses get into cells, how they reproduce, and how they get back out again. There are three main ways viruses get their genetic material into a cell. Envelope viruses attach to receptors on the surface of the cell, which then fuses with the membrane. Remember, they're made out of the same stuff because the virus took its envelope from the last cell it was in, so the new cell doesn't see that it's an invader. Viruses without an envelope essentially trick the cell into thinking that the virus is a harmless resource, like nutrition, and engulfs it. This is called endocytosis, and viruses with an envelope can enter the cell this way too. This virus then has to break out of this vesicle to release its genetic material. A less common method of entering a cell is genetic injection, where the virus punches a hole into the cell membrane and directly injects its genetic material into the cell. Bacteriophages do this to bacteria, but not to human cells. Replication is a very complex process, so I'm having to break it down into perhaps an overly simplistic description, but at least it's a start. In general, RNA viruses replicate in the cell cytoplasm, and DNA viruses replicate in the cell's nucleus, but there are exceptions to this. The host cell then starts transcribing the viral genetic material without knowing that it's not native to the cell. The virus codes for essentially two things, an enzyme called polymerase 
and proteins which form the capsid shell. Polymerase creates copies of the viral genome. This is also when mutations can happen to the virus. In general, viruses mutate very fast. RNA viruses more quickly than DNA viruses because RNA is inherently less stable than DNA. These mutations are random, most having little effect on the virus, but sometimes they can make the virus more dangerous or less dangerous to the host. The capsid proteins self-assemble. From a couple of simple shapes, they can form large, complicated three-dimensional structures which enclose copies of the genetic material inside to form a new virus particle ready to leave the cell. It's worth mentioning retroviruses, which are a type of virus that insert their viral DNA into the DNA of their host. This has happened a lot through our evolutionary history, and in fact, viral DNA sequences make up 8% of our genome, a lot of which we share with our common ancestors. There are three ways viruses leave cells. Apoptosis results in the death of the cell through a self-destruct mechanism. The viruses either burst out, as shown here, or more usually the cell death is a more controlled process where sections clump off to be absorbed by other cells like macrophages. Budding is where the virus exits the cell, taking with it an envelope of the cell's membrane. This doesn't kill the cell, but it will degrade it over time and eventually lead to the cell's death. A kind of opposite process is exocytosis, where the virus has an envelope inside the cell, which it got from the nucleus membrane or another membrane in the cell. Then the virus exits through the cell wall, leaving this membrane behind, and this doesn't kill the cell. I should also mention that some viruses can stay dormant inside cells for years at a time, which is called latency. So that's how viruses invade cells. Now let's zoom out and look at a broader picture of viral infections. The range of a virus is how many different kinds of organisms the virus can infect. Plant viruses don't infect animals, and most animal viruses can't infect humans. In most cases, viruses are adapted to a single species, but some, like rabies, have a larger range, and others can cross over to other species when they mutate. If we look at humans, we can group viruses into those that have been with us for a long time and those which have recently crossed over. Equilibrium viruses have had a long time to adapt to our biology, so tends not to be lethal to us. After all, it's more effective for the virus to keep us alive to infect other people rather than killing us. Non-equilibrium viruses are a lot more dangerous because the virus has not yet adapted to our biology. So the mortality rate for these infections is a lot higher as different people's immune systems react to them in many different ways. Here are some examples of non-equilibrium viruses, including, of course, the coronavirus pandemic that we're currently experiencing. Influenza has got a segmented genome, a genome in many parts, which means that different strains can swap genes if they infect the same host. This means that they're more likely to cross over species and is called antigenic shift which is what happened in the 2009 H1N1 epidemic. Our bodies have got sophisticated mechanisms to detect and destroy viral infections. It starts when a virus is ingested by an antigen-presenting cell, which breaks it down and displays portions of the virus to activate T helper cells. The T helper cells then activate two responses to the virus. B cells produce antibodies that are targeted at the specific virus. These antibodies bind to the outer surface of the virus, neutralizing it. They also tag the virus to be destroyed if it enters a cell by enzymes within the cell. Cells in our body continually display what proteins they have inside them on their surface. If a cytotoxic T cell recognizes a viral protein on the surface of an infected cell, it will go and destroy that cell. Our body's B and T cells keep a memory of the virus, which can make us immune to future infections from that specific virus, but this immunity wears off over time. Sometimes this immunity lasts for many years, but other times, like for the viruses that cause the common cold and the flu, our immunity is not very good because of the high variability of the viruses or because our antibody response is poor. Vaccines are incredibly effective ways of preventing viral infections. It's possible to completely eradicate viral infections from human equilibrium viruses, which we've managed to do with smallpox, and is possible with polio, measles, mumps and rubella if only people would listen. Vaccines contain a modified form of the virus that's been weakened in some way so that they no longer cause an infection, but they do stimulate an immune response, teaching our immune system how to recognise the virus. And where there's no vaccine, antiviral drugs can be used to treat viral infections. 
Although development of these drugs is difficult because they can only target a specific virus which are continually mutating. One example of an antiviral technique are drugs that fool the virus into incorporating dummy DNA into their genomes, which stops them from having the instructions to replicate anymore. So that covers everything I wanted to talk about. If you want to find out more, there are a bunch of links in the video description. You'll also find a link to this image, which I'd love for you to share around the internet, as well as this video. I think the more people who get access to good information about viruses right now, the better. This content wouldn't be possible without the support of my patrons and people buying posters. So if you'd like to help out, please consider it. I hope you're all doing okay, and I'll see you with more science soon.